All right. Well, uh, that's close enough to a minute, perhaps. Um, so I'll just begin uh, this session uh, on um, religion and spirituality. Uh, thank you to everyone for coming to this session this morning, uh, both here and online. And I think we'll probably have a few more people filtering in. I did want to begin with a, a big thanks to the entire organizing committee for for putting together such a, a, a great program, um, a great conference, uh, has made my involvement here very easy to, to participate. Um, and uh, I've watched uh, as you've managed the technology that makes us that has made this all possible as a hybrid session, but also had to overcome the technology at times. So uh, thank you all for for that. Um, I'm re really excited uh, to be chairing this panel, uh, partly because. For me, at least, rel religiosity has long been one of the most noticeable characteristics uh, of Taiwan or of being Taiwanese. And uh, I'm really excited to, to be able to, uh, to have read the papers and now to listen to the presentations um, and introduce these speakers who will help us, I think, to really understand uh, the origins of that religiosity and, and what it all means uh, for, for Taiwanese today. And and in the past. My role beyond that is just, I'll be introducing the speakers, of course, and then keeping time with these cards that everyone has seen uh, as we, we move through. Um, so let me uh, begin with uh, our first presenter, um, who is uh, well known to all, I'm sure, Paul Katz, a uh, research fellow at the Institute of Modern History at Academia Sinica, um, a program director for the Jiang Jingguo Foundation, and perhaps most usefully in this day and age, a real expert on plague gods. So. Please. Okay, thank you, Evan. Thank you for everybody. Is the mic working? You can hear me okay? Okay, actually, in one of my other roles a couple of years ago, I organized my own rapid response uh, COVID-19 project. Uh, at Aki we have a Chinese and an English website. And part of that, I went to Lugang to the uh, Changhuang Temple, and they have... The, also there, they have a one e si, you know, a department of epidemics, and they have ping an shui, which you can drink. So I brought back some uh, ping an shui from Lugang, which has kept me safe and sound uh, through the duration, uh, knock on wood. Uh, now, this, what I'm presenting today is a new project. I've, you know, for the past few years, I've been working on this Western Hunan book that was just published and the 50 years book that was, or as Vincent Cousser and I said, the 50 beers book uh, that was just published. Uh, so this is a new study. It goes back to Taiwan. And it's about this one temple in Dashi called the Lianzuo Shan Guanyin Si or Guanyin Ting. Uh, so it's a case study, and I'm just starting out on it. But it's also, but it's much more. I, it, it's a study of temple and society, and I'm trying to bring in a networking theory to understand the networks that uh, center on this temple. And it, you know, now the the sort of lord of Dashi is Steve Sangren, and I've been in touch with him, and he's very kindly shared some of his notes. I've looked at his thesis and his book. He had. He had a lot to say about Dashi, less about the Guayan Temple. He found that a rather odd, an oddity because it was both a pilgrimage site and a territorial cult. Uh, and so there are a number of networks that are based on this temple. There is a territorial cult east of, of five villages that would rotate. And that seems to have gone out of existence, but it was there active when he was there. There's a pilgrimage, Fenxiang network as well. Uh, then there is the uh, ne networks of people who go to the temple to invite statues of Guayan. Ching Sun, or to bring their own statues there for Kai Guang. Uh, and then there are these various Hakka ritual associations, or Chang Hui, which have their own net networks. Uh, so Dashi is a rather ethnically uh, or sub-ethnically complex place. There are, it's, it's best known for its Zhangzhou natives, but there are plenty of people who are Hakka as well, from Jiangzhou and Huizhou. So then, uh, but this temple that uh, started out as a Hakka sacred site, but in the early 20th century, it started to attract the support and interest of Zhangzhou elites at the same time that Zhangzhou temples started to attract support of Hakka elites. And the key here is spirit writing. Uh, and I'll get into that later on in the talk, time permitting. There should be time permitting because I don't have that much to say because uh, I'll skip the state of the field section of the paper except to note this, uh, the section on Hakka studies because Xiao Xinhuang yesterday in his remarks, he's, he's, you know, he is Hakka. He's devoted some time to Hakka studies. He mentioned sort of five zones or belts of Hakka. Most uh, Hakka research in Taiwan doesn't pay attention to Dashi or its neighboring town of Longtan or other neighboring town of Bada because these are not considered traditionally Hakka areas. Usually Hakka is Nantaoyuan, 
Zhongli, Pingzhen, these areas, and of course Xinzhu, and then other Hakka belts, especially down to Liaodui and and, and so. But in fact, there is a there was a was and is a sizable Hakka population in uh, Dashi. Longtan is essentially largely Hakka, and a lot of people from Bada, especially named Chiu, including my wife's uh, mother's family, uh, who they don't uh, admit it now, but they also have Hakka and ancestry. Uh, so there's so this uh, responds a little bit to Xiao Zhuang, and also the comparison with Southeast Asia. Because what's really interesting is I've had I have now students who are working on, on Hakka communities in Malaysia, and Hakka communities in Malaysia started to accept non Hakka at about exactly the same time that this that the Guanyin Temple in Dashi also started to accept non Hakka all around the early 20th century. Obviously, the the reasons are probably very different, but all, you know has to do with spirit writing, voluntary cults, uh, the need for people to get, to join forces and overcome sub ethnic barriers. But the fact that at one temple in, in Kuala Lumpur, you see Hakka and non-Hakka joined together in 1907 uh, at the same time that the Guayan temple has non-Hakka joining in 1904, at the same time Hakka are joining into the largest uh, uh, Zhangzhou temple, the Pujitang, in 1907, something is happening at this, at this period of time in Hakka communities, both in Taiwan and in Southeast Asia, which merits further examination. That's one thing I intend to do. Uh, if you know, if I can dig up enough data, uh, methodologically, the, the conceptual there are two conceptual frameworks. The first is the concept of political ecology, which is sort of a fancy way of of, of using an, an analysis uh, historical approach. So you focus on actors, economic systems, social networks, the state, and the natural environment. So especially how the development of tea and camphor and the and the networks that are associated with that uh, played a role in religious life. How land reform changed, uh, how two two to eight impacted local elites. The, so I'm trying to not just study religious networks on their own, but put them in a larger context. You know, so a lot of <laughs> the earlier work uh, now Zhang Xun and Jiang Chantang have this concept of Zhongjiao Huanjing Shui, which is sort of underdeveloped, but it mentions this. Mainland China had Zhongjiao Sheng Tai, a religious ecology, which is more related to the idea of Hoshia So and of course in Taiwan the uh, main San Zijing has been Ji Zichen, but but uh, Ji Zichen, the problem with that is that's mostly me uh, measuring space and not people and not networks. So you draw circles and not lines and you don't pay attention. And it's actually, it's really interesting because most of the work on Ji Zichen has nothing to say about uh, about people. So it's male run the run this year. Uh, but so, I, so I'm trying to overcome this with a concept known as social network analysis. I don't know if I'll ever be, get to the point where I can find enough nodes and links to do sociograms of density and centrality, but that's the goal, is to, is to look at people one by one and figure out how they were connected to each other, what other networks they joined. So political ecology is a way to, to give scope to the project and the questions I'm trying to answer. And social network analysis helps to focus on the actors and the people who are involved in these networks. And so these, and, and not only the temple networks, but their other networks, their, their political networks, their economic net, their, their, I'm especially interested in marriage networks. And if I can get enough people to let me look at their household registers or genealogies, it's really, even some people I've interviewed now, these uh, Hakka from, uh, from uh, Xinpu, who regularly intermarried with Hakka from Longtan, you could start, and who are also members of the same Changhui or ritual association, you can start to see how, I, this started in Donggang when I started to realize there was a lot more to people than who were, who were Luju than simply a religious network. It had to do with all sorts of other ties, which I'm going to try to trace thanks to the, to, uh, the wonders of Japanese sources. Now this temple, the Guayan Ting, uh, Guayan Se, was founded in the late 18th century by Hakka elites. It, it continually, uh, flourished due to Hakka elites. It became a pilgrimage center for for Hakka from all over the Taoyuan and Xinju areas. Uh, and in the early 20th century, it started to attract the support of non-Hakka elites. And so that's one of my main interests. And again, there is the territorial network of these five villages, which uh, I which is one, the Sang doesn't have very much to say about it. No, none of the other sources I've found have had much to say about it. I'm have, and I have no idea who the various Luju were, but I'm going to I'm gonna have to trace this down. And figure out why it was particularly these Hakka villages who were involved, and you know what when they moved there. There's talk of uh, there's a lot of talk about how the role that feuding or Xiado played in this, especially with people from Sanxia. But that's all you know. I have, I have to spend a lot more time tracing that. Uh, 
pilgrimage networks, uh, at, going back to at least the 1930s, tr going all the way north from Geelong, uh, south to Miali, but mostly again in the Taoyuan and Shinju areas. Uh, there's quite a lot of data on that already, uh, but still not a lot of, of information on the people who organize these pilgrimages. So, uh, and then these ritual association networks, I found uh, some name lists. And again, there's quite a bit of overlap uh, of Hakka who were involved in both pilgrimage and ritual associations. Now, the really interesting uh, point of change I've discovered again is, you know, in, in 1904, when the Guayan Temple was rebuilt once again or reconstructed, you, you see the involvement of Zhangzhou elites, most, most notably Li Jianbang, who's a very famous uh, Dashi elite. And at the, uh, at the very same time, uh, some of the Hakka from the Guayan Ting were joining with Li, Li Jianbang to build the Pujitang, which is Dashi's most famous temple to Guangong. So you find the same names of the same people on two different temples. And they're both temples to deities that transcend sub-ethnic boundaries. So it's not Sanshan Guolang or Kaizhang Songlang. So this is something that Stefan Foykman had to say in his classic article on Taipei temples. In the early 20th century, based in large part on spirit writing, you see the growth of temple cults to deities that trans transcend ethnicity. And this seems to be the, the case here. I don't think there was ever any spirit writing done at the Guayin Ting per se, but they do have a Shengji Ting or a, a, one of these... Uh, places for a pavilion for burning writing paper, which is often associated with Hakka sacred sites and Hakka spirit writing. So I've, there's a lot more to, to trace down about the trace down on that. But it's clear from uh, temple inscriptions, from placards, that they're the same group of people uh, for, were involved in both the Pu Jitang and the Guan Ting. And one of the most famous is a person named Peng Dianhua, uh, who was a Hakka from Zhudong, who was very active in spirit writing. Uh, but who also supported this Zhangzhou temple, the Puji Tang. So, so somehow this, you know, uh, this growth of spirit writing practices and voluntary religious organizations that were not based on ethnicity played a role in bringing people together uh, around the uh, Guayan Ting, Guayan Si, and that has and that has continued to the, to the present day. So they actually have two uh, Song Jing Tuan, two scripture. There's a there's one that that does scripture chanting in Hoklo, and another that does uh, scripture chanting in Hakka. So they, uh, they operate uh, for both uh, audiences. And this sort of trend of not only, uh, e even temples like the Furengong in Dashi, which is most famous for Kaizhang Songwang, after the feuds of 1853, they also brought in the statue of Sanshan Guowang as a sort of, as a peacemaking gesture. Or one of Longtan's most famous temples, the Yongfu Gong, which was originally for Sanshan Guowang, they added a, a statue for Kaizhang Songwang. So you've seen that you see a conscious effort on the part of temple elites to, you know, God damn it, get over this feuding and start br breaking down these barriers. Uh, so that's some of the issues that I'll be looking at. I have started to collect at the temple already data on pilgrimage and worship networks. And, it's, and uh, I have some of the numbers here from, especially from, uh, 2012 on, and obviously, as one, one would expect, you know, there's a predominance of these temples that are from Dashi itself. Also, Longtan and Yangmei, which is interesting because Yangmei doesn't come into play in a lot of the sources, but it's very important when you actually get down. And seven from Fuxingxiang, which is an, a tile uh, community. And then this made me realize I had to go back and reread Paul Barkley and get into the idea of Kaishan Fufan. And when Dashi was the major staging point for efforts to, uh, to you know, get camphor out of the Atayal community. So actually, it shouldn't be a surprise that there are temples linked there to this Dashi temple, especially because most of the people who are out there interacting with the Atayal were Hakka. Uh, but again, I'm gonna have to prove this, but this is sort of the hypothesis that I have. Uh, what's more interesting is the data on individual worshipers who come to the temple to borrow a statue of Guan Yin or have their statue of Guan Yin put in the temple for a regular Kaiguang ritual. And there you see a predominance uh, of people from Xin Bei Shi and Tai Bei Shi, more than from Xinju. Now, what I have to trace down is, are these, are these people originally from Da Xi or Longtan who moved into Xin Bei? And this is a function of urbanization. I'll have to work on that, but that's, uh, but that's where things stand at the moment. <laughs> so, what I've been able to de determine so far is that these, this territorial cult and the ritual associations uh, seem to have been pretty fixed. Pilgrimage networks started to change, especially with urbanization, uh, and, in, and the same can be held for uh, individuals. 
but uh, there's going to take a lot more to gather a lot more time to gather information on the actual people i'm starting to get lists of names uh, you know i for my joy as a social historian come anthropologist is to trace down people's names and trace down how they got to know each other and what their marriage networks were or what their commercial networks were uh, and I'd also, so I'm going to try to do that. I'm also going to try to figure out exactly the significance of this early 20th century change and the role that spirit writing played in it. Because obviously spirit writing in Taiwan, uh, Hakka played an incredibly important role in it. And so this has to be uh, traced down. And the other thing I want to do is there's, you know, most of the, it's it, most of the history of this temple has been done only through the colonial era. There has not been a real study of how land reform uh, impacted the elite who supported this temple, and how political factions uh, uh, influenced that, or how even the construction of the Shiman Reservoir, the Shiman Shui, who, how that changed the ecology, and how that would have impacted networks as well. These are all questions that are out there uh, that I'm going to try to answer in the future. So that's all I have to say for now. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Um, I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions. Uh, we'll go through all the presentations and then take questions uh, collectively at the end. Oh, you can. Okay. So, uh, while we're doing the technical edition here, um, let me introduce our second speaker, uh, uh, Professor Robert Weller, who is a professor of anthropology at Boston University. Um, scholar of religions of, of Taiwan and China, although, as he pointed out yesterday, religion might not be the best word. Uh, and I guess uh, also thinking in terms of, of contemporary rel relevance of earlier work, um, the salvation ceremony is something we perhaps always need. And so I guess you're returning to some of that very early research. Uh, again, we'll hear more about it now. Thanks. Thank you. And yes, we are. <laughs> so I'm actually starting here from a set of puzzles. One of them is an ethnographic thing I haven't known what to do with since 1978 when I first ran into it. So I'm really going back to my very beginnings in Taiwan. Um, but the, the, uh, the official ones are more anthropological uh, puzzles that I want to deal with. And in particular, I want to start with a famous old Rodney Needham one from, I think, 1968 where he pointed out in a short article in Man that there's a cross-cultural strong relationship between percussion and transition. So percussive noise, percussive music, and moments of transition in ritual context. And he said, it's really clear this exists, and I have no idea why. Right? It just says, he says it's seemingly intractable, and then he just gives up at that point, end of article. So that's it, that's the puzzle. <laughs> Um, it's usually not brought up as a puzzle. It's usually brought up just as the percussion goes with transition. But in fact, it, it, if you read the piece, it's a puzzle. Um, so I want to think about that. And, and especially if you think about the time, you know, the 1970s ritual studies was all about analyzing the rich symbolism of rituals. So here's this totally non-discursive, even anti-discursive medium noise. Um, like why, what is this doing? in a ritual. So that's the first um, puzzle. The second one, and I should contextualize this by saying I, I'm in the middle of writing a book about silence. And so this is a piece, this is a small piece of that. But noise isn't the only non-discursive thing in our repertoire. Silence is just as non-discursive as noise. So why think about Taiwanese rituals that you know? It's really hard to think of silence. And I'll talk about a little bit, that's actually the puzzle, the other, the ethnographic puzzle is a, a silence at a funeral. Um, but it's very difficult to think of silences. So why, and I think that's also cross-culturally true. Uh, silence is rare, noise is common. Why? So I'm drawing mostly on six funerals I went to in 1978. It's stuff I never used in, in, in writing, um, but it really was just because I finally had a, a question that that would let me let me do that. So I've been rereading ancient dusty field notes. All right. So the first puzzle, the Needham, the Needham one. Why is uh, transition related to percussive noise? And there, I think the answer lies in 
recognizing not the symbolic nature of ritual, although that obviously exists, but the formal nature of ritual. Starting for me, the most important observation being just that ritual repeats. If it doesn't repeat, we wouldn't call it a ritual. But to, in order to repeat means not that it's the same as something in the past, that, but that we're willing to count it as something the same as in the past. So how do we know if it counts as the same? So we need to mark it, right? It, it's marked by convention. So let me take the, the simplest, maybe, example of percussion and transition, not religious, going to a classical music concert, right? Where there's moments when you applaud and moments when you don't applaud. You don't applaud because somebody played a passage that was really cool or virtuosic or something, right? It's forbidden. You don't applaud if you know at all what you're doing. You don't applaud between movements, no matter how rousing the end of the movement was. You don't applaud. You do applaud at the end of the piece. This is pure convention. And in fact, 200 years ago, that is not how concerts happened, right? So there's a historical, you can understand this historically, um, but it kind of doesn't matter what the historical explanation is. The point is there's a convention. In jazz, it's a different convention, right? You, if you know what you're doing, you applaud after every solo. Right? Different opera, you applaud after the arias, but not at other moments in the middle of the opera. So that, right, all these different conventions that have developed, you can see it's conventional, but also how framing it is. So what are, what's applause is percussive noise. And we, we frame the concert, right? The conductor comes out, we applaud. The end of the concert, we applaud. The end of each piece, we applaud. We're framing the internal divisions of the event. It's not exactly a ritual, but it's got these very ritualized moments. We're framing the internal transitions and the external transitions into this, you know, the world of everyday life, you know, my life on the street, getting to the concert hall, to the one where the concert begins, right? The lights go down and we applaud. That one. So the applause is really framing the ritual, framing this world that's as if we were in the other world, as if we were in the world of the movie that we're watching, whatever, as if, as if uh, this wine were really Jesus's blood, right? And all of those things within that frame, they're true. So that's what ritual does and that's what transition moments do. So why do we want something non-discursive to mark those moments is because discourse always has to be within some world of convention. Language is a world of convention. Discourse is within some world. What can represent that thing that isn't any world, that moment of transition, you need something non-discursive. I think that's without justifying this at all, that's why in so many myth, myth traditions around the world, the time before the creation of the world is chaos. It's not silence, right? The opposite of this world of human language and symbolism is not silence, it's noise, it's chaos. So um, that to me is where you look for the answer to the Needham, the Needham question. So just a, some quick examples, moving to Taiwan now, the loudest, one of the loudest places I've ever been in, I think was in sometime doing my dissertation field work in the late seventies, um, the local god, Qing Shui Zhu Shigong, had come back to town. There was a big procession, so a transition point for, for the god. And somebody like dragged me into the pr procession. And I was, anybody could have joined in, honestly, but I was sort of weirdly flattered by this. So I, I joined the procession, but it hadn't occurred to me that people were going to be throwing firecrackers at us big strings of scary firecrackers exploding at our feet. I don't think it was personal, they were exploding at everybody's feet, but it was scary and it was really loud, really loud. Now, the God protected me as it did everybody else. The only effects were some temporary ringing in the ears, I suppose, but that, you know, that was it. But that noise at that moment of transition, it's actually, completely normal, right? The, all of you, this is familiar, and if, even if you don't work on religion, I'm sure this is familiar. Um, funerals, without, you know, the ethnographic juicy stuff always gets sacrificed in these short presentations, so I'm sacrificing it, but um, funerals within the structure of the day of the burial itself, and again, I'm thinking of 1978, and realize much has changed in Taiwan and in funerary practice since 1978, but it, because my purposes are really theoretical here, I think it doesn't matter. So 1978, the big transition inside that day is the movement of the body 
from the village, from the house, out to where it's being buried. That's the crucial transition. That's the moment when you go from corpse to ancestor, right? It's, it's the crucial transition, and it's loud. I mean, everything is, it's a Taiwanese ritual, it's loud. But this is really loud. So the typical way these were done, and I think this was true of five of the six funerals I saw that year, um, you have to have a Western brass band. You have to have a Chinese band, right? Traditional uh, Beiguan band, uh, right? A traditional Chinese band. And you have the priest, the Sai Gong, whom you've hired to do this, or they're beating their symbol for, for their own thing. And all of this is happening simultaneously. So it's not like, let's enjoy the Western music, which was universally horribly played. But you know, it wasn't like that. It was like the Western music is totally intertwined in some weirdly avant-garde way with the Chinese music, with the gong from the priest. It's this kind of chaotic, it's not exactly percussion, but it's noise. It's, it's, it's experienced very much as noise or as, as a kind of a, a version of Taiwanese ra now. Um, so just to say this is a major transition moment, it kind of, it's kind of easy to analyze within the Needham um, framework, especially if you add this, the framing kind of explanation for it that I've given. So let me turn to the second thing, which, as I said, is really my primary interest in, in, in doing this. So why not silence, which seems to fulfill the same kind of role, at least potentially. And I would offer two reasons. The first is the fragility of silence compared to noise. Silence is so easy to break, right? Somebody's, one of your phone goes off. Some child cries. Somebody doesn't like what you're saying and says something. Silence breaks like that. Noise doesn't break at all from any of those events, right? Noise just absorbs it. So I think um, silence is inherently fragile. And so it's used, it is used in rituals, um, but it's used in a very controlled kind of way. And I, I would say three, three main ways that I could think of at least. One is to create rhythm. So rhythm, and think of just this rhythm, right? It's not the claps, it's the silence between the claps, or it's one way to think about it anyway. Without the silence, there is no, there is no rhythm. Rituals work like that too. Um, if any of you have been like to the Confucian temple ritual in Taipei, so slow, right? burn the first, he's telling me I only have five minutes left, so I don't want to do this imitation, which would take forever, but you know, if you've, if you've been there, you know. Uh, for me, it's just deadly boring. I like the Rana ones, I hate these ones, but what's the silence doing there? Right? They're very short silences, no matter how long and boring they feel at the time, um, creating a rhythm, a, a very slow, courtly sort of rhythm that's echoed in these funerals I think at the moment when, if, the, if any of you have been to these kinds of funerals, um, there's a period when offerings are set out in front of the um, temporary tablet for the dead person and a photo of them usually. And then all the descendants are called to burn incense there and bow down in front of that altar um, by a master of ceremonies who in this case was usually the village head, but you know, it could be the retired school principal, right? Somebody like that is saying, you know, now the sons, now the <clears throat> daughters, now the grandson, right? Like that. That's a sort of um, imitation, less pompous and boring, but still an imitation of that Confucian rhythmic style. So that's one. The second, not particularly common in these sorts of Taiwanese rituals, is the moment of silence, right? But we all know moments of silence, which are modern. So they're an early 20th century, like World War I era creation. They, they, they weren't really used anywhere before that. And the, the idea there was 10 minutes of silence, which within a year was five minutes of silence. Because fragile, right? And then within a few years after that, it was two minutes of silence, and then one minute of silence. And now, in some occasions, at least according to journalistic reports, they've replaced the silence completely with a minute of applause. Noise, because noise is a more robust way of doing this same function. So moments of silence have to be very carefully delimited. And you can think, it's easy for me to think of failed moments of silence too. Uh, and then finally, there's disciplined silence. I won't take the time to talk about it, but think of 
uh, the most famous author on silence probably in the 20th century, Thomas Merton, a Trappist monk, who don't actually have vows of silence in spite of what we say. There are no monks with vows of silence, but they live a mostly silent um, life. But that's, very, that's a very virtuosic kind of silence. Or think of wall meditators in Chinese traditions, right? It's very virtuosic silence. And then there's also disciplined silence, not disciplined by your own masterful cultivation, but disciplined by somebody else, a bride in a sedan chair, again, a traditional bride in a sedan chair where she's silent. Everything around here is allowed. I don't have time to go into that one. So that's fragility. That's the first one. So it's very carefully contained. Um, the second one is, I think silence doesn't just, couldn't just frame, silence often unframes. And here think of the most silent, the most famous silence in contemporary music, John Cage's four minutes and 33 seconds, right? Which was the first performance lasted four minutes and 33 seconds, that's the title. And it's just a piece of nobody does anything. So it was a, the original performance was a piano, the guy sat down for four minutes and 33 seconds, closed the keyboard cover and it was over. And Cage's point was, there is no such thing as silence. Listen to the sound, you hear the street, you hear the birds, uh, you hear the person next to you breathing, you hear the blood in, in your own body circulating, right? There, there is no such thing as silence. He's unframing everything. He was unframing the idea of what a concert is, of what music is, of what silence is, it's unframing. And the other example I've developed more is uh, from literature actually, Lawrence Stern's Tristram Shandy, I don't know, oops. Mm. Don't know if any of you have read that, an 18th century novel where he um, intersperses it with weird textual things like there's a blank page, there's just nothing on it. There's a black page, just ink, both sides of the page, just ink. There's a, a marbled page. And he, what he's doing is messing with the medium so that you're outside the frame of the book, the frame that the book covers actually create for you, right? You're, no, you're not taken up by the world that the novel presents, but he's yanking you out of it into, for me, the materiality of the book itself is what those pages do, but he, he used many techniques like this in there. So we have silence again, kind of unframing what you do. Rituals don't want to be unframed normally, which now that I don't have any time left, brings me to the final puzzle, which is the very last thing at a funeral. If you stick it out all the way through that burial day, after the burial, uh, after the Saigong do their like really entertaining carnivalesque kind of thing in the evening, fire eating, acrobatics, clowning around, there's a huge pile of paper spirit money and the descendants all gather around holding onto each other's morning dress and just watch the flames die down silently. And then it's over. It's like the one silence I can really think of in the ritual. So the, just to point to where I would try to weasel out of the problem that's posing for my theoretical structure here. One is, for me, that burial day in particular is about emotional choreography. We anthropologists, for some reason, don't talk about that very much. but. It's really about emotional choreography going from, you know, you must wail now, like you must wail now to the burial itself, to this kind of clowning around really fun stuff in the evening to that very quiet moment. So I think that because of that, and because the numbers of people are very limited at that point, that, you know, one in the morning, two in the morning, there's no street traffic anymore, um, that you can afford to let that ritual just unframe. And I have another way out too, which is it's actually rhythmic, but a really slow rhythm because it's a, it's a traditional funeral. You got to do more stuff in a week and a, a week, right? Seven sevens. So that this is really just that break in between things. So that at any rate, um, let me conclude at, at that rather fuzzy point. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, 
th thank you very much again. A lot, a lot there. We'll have a lot of questions and conversation, I'm sure. Um, but let me now introduce our, our third and final speaker, uh, who is joining us um, remotely, although not, as I understand it, originally as planned, but things happen. Um, so uh, I'd like to welcome Jakob Tischer, who is a PhD candidate uh, in anthropology at Boston University. Um, Boston University, sorry, uh, where he is working on, in addition to the, the, the paper he's going to present today, uh, notions of authenticity, um, and I think very important uh, for all of us, the role of humor in political communications via social media, which often seems so lacking in humor. Um, so, but let, this is the presentation for today. Uh, Jakob, please. Thank you very much, Evan, for the introduction, and thank you to the organizers of the World Congress for allowing this, or for having this flexibility with remote participation, because, um, yeah, I don't know if I would have been able to participate in person otherwise. Um, and I don't know, following Rob Weller's presentation just now, perhaps 15 minutes of silence would have been better, but I don't know, we'll find out afterwards if it might have been. Um, well, in this presentation, I'm, I'm talking about pilgrimages and I'm trying to connect the, the theme of making Taiwan to my field work on pilgrimages. Um, I would like to start with an, an observation that I had during, during field work, which was um, that I was struck basically by, by conversations I had with people who would draw not so much attention on their religious experience or religious or motivations for participating in the pilgrimage, but rather who would point out um, that these walking in the pilgrimage allowed them to get to know Taiwan. So they saw it as um, Taiwan, as, as pathways to getting to know Taiwan. And that's kind of how I engage the theme of making Taiwan. Um, is someone responsible for the slides? Could you move on to the next one or do I have to do that somehow? Thank you. Um, yeah, so I engaged that team, the theme of making making Taiwan by looking at what it means in practice for people, how how the people I spoke with made Taiwan for themselves. And by looking at that, I also am interested in how this making of Taiwan expresses as a empirically observable practice that kind of people share across individuals. So I treat pilgrimages here kind of as a technique or as a conduit to connect the idea of being Taiwanese with a more concrete experience. And from that experience, it's possible to draw meaning making um, activities. And that experience also allows to create belonging and affiliation with a place. So in a sense, for me, this is an authentic or for for participants, actually, I treat it as an authentic experience that then also works as an authenticating experience in that it authenticates someone's place in Taiwan. I would also like to connect this. Thank you to uh, the genre of that was kind of I didn't even need to say anything um, to a, a genre of increasingly popular activities among younger people, especially, um, who are looking to connect with their homeland. And this is the activity of Huan Dao, or as some people now use it in an anglicized gerund kind of way as Huan Daoing. Um, so where the verb actually becomes a thing, a, a noun. And um, in Huan Dao, this has become kind of a, a, a popular theme in documentaries, a few movies as well has gained steam this way. Um, we can go to the next slide. This shows a few posters, movie posters. Thank you. Um, and what's basically um, noteworthy about this, this um, practice is that it's a slowed down mode of travel. And this slowed down mode of travel is important because it allows gaining access to something that is more akin to the real or original Taiwan. And this original Taiwan is often imagined as consisting of scenes of breathtaking pastoral rural beauty and is a place inhabited by friendly, genuine people. 
And pilgrimages are kind of are very similar structurally, I think, in that they also facilitate um, experiences like that. What's different with a lot of Juan Dao activities is that they are often undertaking in small groups or individually. And pilgrimages rarely are. Perhaps a, a word on data at this point. So what I'm talking about here is part of a chapter that I'm writing as part of my dissertation. And that's the dissertation is based on 16 months of field work, um, not all of which had to do with, with pilgrimages. Actually, that was only a minority of the field work that I did. Um, the, the thesis is more broadly, as Evan actually mentioned in the introduction, is more broadly on the notion of authenticity. And I think authenticity for me also um, mirrors strongly in current experiences of, of pilgrimages. So I spend some time um, following people in the Wenhua um, Zhu, the culture committee of Bai Sha Tun Gong Tian Gong, the temple that organizes the Bai Sha Tun pilgrimage, the second largest in Taiwan, and also fieldwork that I conducted with a smaller group of mostly young people in rural Zhanghua Xian. Thank you. So authenticity here in pilgrimages, um, where does authenticity figure? At least for participants in the Bai Sha Tun pilgrimage, it is in the practice of walking the land. So walking pilgrimages are not necessarily the majority of, of pilgrimages. Um, so here you can see it written out as Tu Bu Jin Xiang. Um, but for, for people who are actually walking, this is an important part of their experience that they gain. Um, walking is crucial because it basically it, it mediates experiences through, for example, physical hardship. Um, you have sore feet, you get blisters, you're tired because of this lack of sleep at night because it's noisy and you know this, the ground is hard. It's usually temple floors. Um, you lose a toenail here or there. All of these things have happened. Perhaps you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, on these approximately 150 kilometers between Bai Sha Tun and Bei Gang, the uh, end point of the pilgrimage. So you walk this usually over the course of about eight days and um, you walk it twice, you walk it back and forth. So hardship, the experience of hardship is something that authenticates um, the pilgrimage experience in a religious way and showing, you know, devotion, commitment, but also in that it creates just intense um, memories of a, of a time that you set apart from other times in your life. And this is not necessarily always conceived of as in terms of hardship, but it's also joy. And, and um, there are very positive experiences here because, and those connect a lot with the social aspects of the pilgrimage. So these are friendships or lasting connections that people build. So people kind of identify as pilgrims and start coming back, often, you know, connect in social media groups after and beyond the pilgrimage. So that becomes an important part of being actually. Um, beyond that, there are the more chance encounters with friendly people, volunteers at the side of the road. That's a very important part of the entire pilgrimage too, I think where hospitality shows in these encounters with people, with people who own, um, who live by the side of the, the pilgrimage and, you know, offer food or drink or a place um, to stay, a toilet when you need it. All of this is really crucial to this experience. And perhaps that can go some ways to explaining why walking pilgrimages have grown more, more popular recently. So just in terms of the numbers, of people participating in the Baisha Twin pilgrimage. Um, just between 2015 and 2022, the number of registered participants rose from roughly 10,000 to about 90,000. But this fast growth can also reduce authenticity in the eyes of, of some participants. And the people who participate for this purely um, experiential value are part of the problem here because they can be seen as freeloaders who don't really, you know, care a lot about, you know, the background, who don't invest um, a lot if they come back, if they don't come back, for example, or if they don't participate in rituals. 
for, for other participants, this can increase distance from the deity. Um, in addition, with more people participating, uh, it's more attractive for politicians to come as well. So President Tsai Ing-wen, for example, now comes every year um, to spend at least a few hours on the pilgrimage and walk with people, but also domestic or, or local politics where factions um, are competing for resources within the temple. So all of this kind of creates a more complicated fuza image of the of the, the pilgrimage experience. And for some people, for some pilgrims who yearn, who yearn for simplicity, this can be um, an, a turn off, essentially. Um, what this also suggests is that authenticity definitely consists of layers. So for most people, if walking is already a pretty authentic um, kind of experience, for others, more needs to be there. So perhaps um, pilgrims can think of authenticity as a as an onion in a way where they peel away layers and try to get to the core. And that's especially for people who are interested in increasing their uh, authentic experiences. Examples of possibilities of increasing them are becoming involved with one of those organizing, um, one of the sub organizations of a temple like the culture committee um, where they meet like-minded individuals, but also another Example, and here we can go to the next slide. Thank you. And I'm sorry for, thanks. Um, is that a, a lot of people actually recommended to me to walk in addition to the pilgrimage to walk the Yu Zhuang after the pilgrimage, which is kind of a, a territorial tour um, where the second Mazu of Bai Shatun is, is walking around the, the her jurisdiction essentially. And this is not technically, technically called a pilgrimage or Jinxiang, but in experiential terms, it is quite similar as it consists of walking mostly. And it's also many of the participants are the same as in the pilgrimage. So it's people from outside of Bai Shatun. Um, and it's interesting, at least in, in my opinion, that, that many of these people who participate see that as a homecoming of sorts because they treat by Saturn as a second home in Taiwan, a place that for them um, expresses an authentic version of Taiwan that they can draw on. The recommendation also uh, was not made in religious terms to me as you know the superior ritual experience, for example, but in terms of experiencing uh, scenic beauty of Bai Shatun as a place and to experience the people along the way, uh, talk to people. Another way, and this is the next slide. Um, another way would be to participate in one of the new pilgrimage startups. I put those in scare quotes um, that are run by religious entrepreneurs who kind of who create connections with followers, especially through social media. So that would be on Lion groups, for example, Facebook groups, blogs, things like that. And this is, I won't go into too much detail here, but um, my main uh, research focus was actually on this, on a small group like this. So as in the photo, you can see there's, this is an, a very small entourage of, of participants, which also allows those participants to get a more intimate experience of the process. So they all, they take turns carrying Matsu, for example, in this backpack-like sedan chair. To return to the beginning, um, I said in the beginning that I see pilgrimages as conduits to gain experience of Taiwan with some participants caring or expressing less of um, concern for the religious aspects and more caring about the experience they gather. So a question that could be asked is that if, if that um, amounts to a secularization of pilgrimages, and what I'm thinking here is that apart from the difficulty of applying a concept like that in Taiwan, where it can legitimately be asked um, if pilgrimage, not just in Taiwan, but also elsewhere, if pilgrimage has ever been purely religious and what that would mean here. I mean, in addition to that difficulty, there is also the possibility that that participation in pilgrimage facilitates growing interest in some individuals. So I've met people who participated in longer pilgrimages like this one on the picture 
that is a 40 day pilgrimage and who got a lot more comfortable with conducting religious ritual and got incorporated into the group they were participating in. Um, so these are also ex example, other examples. In conclusion then, um, what I would say about pilgrimages and their importance in Taiwan, um, in the making of Taiwan is that pilgrimages are an adaptable medium that allows for participation at various levels of engagement. So you have these more deep um, engagements that perhaps we could term religious, but then it's also possible to, to participate more for a this experiential um, value that one can take away. And I think the importance goes rather the other way, especially if we look at also Huan Dao as a phenomenon, the importance goes the other way, not in the form of secularization, but, and this is probably dialectical anyway, um, but that it allows people, because pilgrimages allow people to experience Taiwan in a certain way, that this actually extends the sociocultural impact that pilgrimage has in a very modern society, such as Taiwan's. Here I'm at the end of my, of my presentation. I thank you for your attention. I hope it wasn't 15 minutes of silence, and if so, that was enjoyable. And I look forward to questions and comments. Thank you very much. Um, you're muted for me, I'm sorry. I'm the only one who hasn't yet figured out the unmute. Um, so I was saying, uh, Jakob, uh, sorry about that. Uh, thanks to, to you and all the presenters for staying so much on time. Um, and that leaves us with a lot of time for questions and comments from the audience. So I will turn things over to the audience. The ritual here is, of course, to come up and speak into the, the microphone. And if the presenters who are in the room want to, to, to be in the front, the, so you can respond to the questions that might work. Hi, I just want to kind of say thanks very much for your talk. So my question is to you, Rob. Um, so when we, when you were looking kind of at this concept of silence, which I think is really, really quite incredible. What about this, like the notion of, say, visual noise? So although, because this is something that of which my work of working with deaf children is the idea that although there's no silence in deafness, there's still noise, right? Um, and the idea that that noise is visual. So I was just thinking at those moments when you say that the convention is to silence, it might not necessarily be silence because you could still be having that internal conversation in your head. So the only the silence here is just not making a noise, right? Yourself. So I don't know whether or not that actually this is something that you've kind of thought about this idea of visual noise. So watching something is actually still creating noise. It's just not audio. Yeah. So, okay. Thanks. Yeah, I think. Thanks. That's, that's a great question. I had not really thought about visual noise, but I, I have thought about the problem of what, what's going on inside your head. Right, just because you're being quiet doesn't mean that there's there's no noise happening in internally, and it, uh, I don't even want to use this room as an example. If we think of that classical music concert where your concentration is flagging and you're not really listening to the music anymore, and your mind is who knows where your mind is, and there's a thousand other people in the room with you, and their minds are in 999 other places than yours. So I think that's actually, that's normal. That's part of it. And in that sense, I, I'm not sure that there, Cage was right. There really isn't silence. So visual silence I hadn't thought about, although of course I have written a little bit in the past about Zha now as a, as an, as a desirable aesthetic, right? And other people, uh, Adam Chow and, and Hong, what they call Hong Hua up there, uh, right? So there is, that is, that is related to the idea of visual noise. I thought I was, I mean, I was going to say, I thought I was pushing silence and noise too far already with pieces of paper and, and John Cage. Um, 
but maybe because I'm pushing it, I'm letting it push that way visual noise is a good way to think about it. So again, the bride in the sedan chair, there's actually very little, there may be a lot of internal noise, but there's no visual noise at all. That's also minimized just as much as her own ability to speak has been minimized at that point. So I think the visual noise, and then the, I, I do, in the written version of this, I do talk a little bit just about the renownness of most Taiwanese ritual, which is, which is every medium. Right, certainly visual, but it, it's smell, right? They smell, right? The food vendors, the firecrackers, the incense, every, right? Everything smells and, and they sound, of course, too. So my questions are also for Bob. Um, first one, when you talk about noise and percussion, percussion being used at moments of transition, do you mean transitions within the ritual or, okay, both. <laughs> All right. So my first thought was, and, and maybe Jun Bean might have some thoughts on this too. Um, when I think of percussion, I think of it very much like um, exploding firecrackers and you're the ritual specialist, but as I understand, those scare away bad spirits, right? The noise is supposed to scare things away. So I would think of percussion as being like that, you know, fulfilling that same function. And then the question about silence, um, I think you might need to narrow your um, parameter to think about silence between sounds, you know, even small silences, like in a lot of like um, mantra um, performances, you know, there's a silence there. So that's all. I just want to make the comment about the silence. Yeah. So that's it. But I don't know. Jun Bean, I bet he has some ideas. Yeah. Putting you on the spot. I think what you were saying. Uh, sorry, I'm yeah. sorry to uh, ask you to stand on so that the picture uh, is now is a question. I just. Oh, right, I it's some. It's something about the noise, and there is a, a term, uh, Southern Bisa, uh, is describing uh, the noise used in rituals to repel the, the, the bad uh, spirit, spirituals. And that, I think that's what uh, Nancy just said at the first part. I just added it is not really a question. So for for Nancy's question, if you look at some of the early work, the work of Donald Harper on early texts, and you realize that there are terms for shrieking as a way of exorcism. There's also he focused on the word jie, like jie huan de jie, which is also has the yen spine, which is jie to interrogate, which also has g as uh, sort of a top knot. So even the way you do your hair can have an exorcistic function and way, the way that you sit uh, or the way that you lean against something. So there's in the real, uh, the Jin Ke Zhuan, you know, the person who tried to assassinate the, the Qin emperor when he was dying, he leaned down in a certain way, which, was, which is a way of showing contempt. So uh, in a visual. So, and the, so the, apart from, you know, apart from sound, even a hairstyle or a posture uh, has exorcistic and ritual qualities as well. So I just add that to the equation, sorry. So thank you. I think if you, if I had asked those people around there, like when the firecrackers were going off at our feet, not that you could actually speak over that, but you know, had I asked, people would, I think there's two possibilities of how they would answer. One is what you, you two said, which is some sort of be share, be be shot, be right, that kind of it's evil spirits answer. And the other one would be um, what I usually got when I asked people to explain ritual symbolism, which is we're Chinese. <laughs> Just that. Or they would say, I remember asking why you stick the knife that you killed the pig with in, in the back of the pig's head. And they would say, Kasuyani. It looked, it's prettier like that. Like what kind of, that's, but that's really the same answer as we're Chinese, right? That's really just to say 
there might be an explanation, but I don't care what it is. It doesn't matter what it is. We do this because it's the convention to do this. And I feel that the firecrackers are actually better understood in that way, rather than accepting the statement you would get from an educated informant, which would, like you two people are. <laughs> uh, the other, I think your other point was different, kind of about the those micro silences that are always there. So I, I do write about that elsewhere in the book. If you read, you know, sociolinguistics of silence, this is people doing incredibly tedious research with stopwatches, like how many microseconds do I have to be quiet for you to know that it's your turn to speak, right? that kind of thing. But so that's a real thing. I wouldn't do the research myself, but you know, that is a real thing. And that those silences are absolutely part of it. There is no language. I mean, I like the postmodern version of this, but you know, there is no language without silence in it. I just want to mention there's a word for that in Japanese. And I don't think we use it in Chinese or space. I mean, we're not going to get a stopwatch out. People talk about this, you know, there's a real term for that in music. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, other questions. Yeah, please. And then, is, is, did you have a question in the back? <laughs> so, thank you very much to all of you. It was uh, fascinating. And uh, I do have a question to Professor Weller, actually. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to listen to you. And um, I was particularly intrigued by the expression, actually, used about the emotional choreography. This is something I'm, I use myself in my book. Um, I talked about uh, choreography of emotions, but again, it was related to noise. It was related to a, a Chinese uh, uh, ethnic uh, minority uh, dance class in Taiwan. I observed and I attended with migrants. So my question is, um, to what extent uh, emotions and silence go together? And to what extent uh, silence can construct emotion or um, more than emotion and silence together, wouldn't it again be the sort of gap between noise and silence which produces emotions, and perhaps which kind of emotions in front of the of the fire? It's, it's a lot of just random ideas from the top of my mind. Thank you. That so the next question is going to these two people, okay, but, <laughs> but that, that's a lovely question. I wish I could answer it. If I could really answer it, I think I would have a more satisfactory answer to the puzzle at the end of the, of the talk today. So I don't know. Silence can be extremely powerful emotionally, uh, but so can noise, right? Think of the, you know, the collective, excitement of a concert, a rock concert that you go to or something really loud, that kind of thing. Uh, the interaction, so rhythm, rhythm can be emotionally super powerful, which is the interaction between noise and silence, if you want to use those terms for it. Um, so basically, I don't know, I'm going to think about that. I'm going to check out your book, although I guess that choreography was literal. <laughs> <laughs> My question is for Jakob because you're requesting or you're requesting that, um, but also because I, I did want to ask and it actually connects Jakob and uh, Robert, which is how do people, what do people do um, in terms of silence versus sound in pilgrimages. So obviously the traditional, like I, you know, the, when you observe people entering a town or approaching a temple, there's plenty of noise in a, in a procession, but what about when they're just walking along? Um, maybe I should not be looking at your picture on the screen, but that's, <laughs> I'm looking at you, Yaga. Um, do people have conversation 
Are there periods of contemplative silence? Is there um, an expectation that they will talk about certain things or that, you know, are there episodes of chanting? Like when you're, when you're talking about walking for 40 days, uh, there's, that's a lot of time to fill. <laughs> and some of us would definitely fill that time with talking chatter. And I'm just wondering how, um, how people in these pilgrimages understand their, what they should be doing with their mind and with their voice, with their interaction. Should they be, you know, if they, if it's supposed to be about looking at beautiful scenery, are we supposed to be talking about the beautiful scenery all the time? The way my good friend who goes hiking with me in Taiwan narrates the entire experience uh, for us, or are we supposed to be like doing the kind of um, Western Christian awe thing where we stand in silence before the awesomeness of nature. Like how does, how do noise and silence figure into these pilgrimages that you're looking at? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, that's a very good question. I haven't thought of pilgrimage in terms of noise and silence, but, um, I think there's very, by my experience, at least, there's very little room for for a lot of for for lots of silence, even in the small groups with um, with a forty day pilgrimage, for example. Unless you're actually going alone, um, there is usually conversation. Or I mean, it, it yeah, it's kind of small. It can be a small group or or two people um, conversation, but there is very rarely, I think, absolute silence i haven't i don't really recall moments in which i could contemplate much because I, I mean also i was trying to engage people in conversation a lot of the time to um actually to get their take on things um so i didn't i mean at some points i tried to actually withdraw and go a little bit you know take a distance in order to have this silence when i kind of needed a break but yeah, when I think about it, it actually came in concert with physically removing myself as well, because otherwise I wouldn't, I don't think I would have had much of that space. Um, the other question on narrating the beauty of the, of, of what one sees, um, I think that was also came actually more out when I was actually raising the topic rather than, um, this was not really spontaneous conversation. A lot of the times so it was not really, um, uh, you know, that a conversation starter or something like that. It was something that I had to, to kind of, um, that came up when I was asking for what people were actually trying to, to achieve when walking on pilgrimages. Yeah, please. Having gone on a number of pilgrimages on buses, Yolancha, it's a very different experience. I once went with a group from Donggang up to Taipei, and we spent the entire time on the bus watching Zhuge Liang Wu Tai Show. <laughs> and the rest singing, and the rest singing karaoke. <laughs> But there's also times of quiet, you know, sang shi shui jiao, xia shi niao niao, some of this. So, <laughs> it, so there, there are, but in general, uh, Yolanda pilgrimage is not quiet, but it can be. <laughs> okay, sorry. Let me just add a short, a short comment. I think Shelly and I have probably had the same friend narrate uh, hikes. <laughs> so we are part of a, a pilgrimage network, uh, perhaps of some sort. Um, there was a question here. <laughs> This is for Professor Katz. Um, so as part of your political ecology framework, you mentioned kind of in passing the economic structures and arrangements that you would be interested in following um, and the commercial networks and so forth. And in the abstract, I think there was a reference to um, dramas for peace and tranquility. So I was, I was curious about um, conflicts and um, how if you are worshiping and intermarrying and doing business with all these people, um, whether you need those, um, you know, dramas for peace and tranquility because you're fighting with each other all the time and whether um, the economic arrangements and networks um, actually uh, produce conflict or if they actually uh, could ameliorate conflicts because you're 
doing business with each other and you're all married to each other and so you actually have to get along. But uh, thank you for such a thoughtful question. You know, I, I went rather rapidly in the woo, oral presentation. So the the ping and she or the dr dramas of peace and tranquility are performed as part of this five village rotational system. And these are all five Hakka villages. And so the, the dramas are just sort of it's, it's not a result of enmity. It's a, it's a, it's a regular performance or to ensure peace and tranquility in the coming year. What I, the other thing about the Guayan Temple, it's located right up, up along the Dahan River. So it was along the, it was used by Hakka camphor traders and tea traders. And, there was, and it almost functioned as a guild hall. There were places where you could sleep. So if you didn't want to go and if you were, you know, carrying tiao dan, you know, and carrying goods, and you didn't want to go into Zhang, in, into Dashi and mingle with the Zhangzhou natives who might not always be that friendly, you could sleep at uh, at the temple. So the the economy that so this temple was part of the Hakka tea trading and camphor uh, trading networks in the Qing Dynasty and through the colonial colonial era, and a lot of these uh, ritual association and pilgrimage groups. Uh, these temples are often along the routes that were used by these traders. Uh, so, so there is some of that. What I have not figured out yet is what happened in the post-war era when a lot of these networks fell apart, when land reform came in, because, you know, most of the temple's lands were in Longtan and a lot of the land was given back to people. And so how did these changes uh, impact the network? So, so again, when the temple starts as part of a Hakka trade economic network system uh but by the early 20th century uh it starts to it opens up to non-haka people just at the same time that Zhangzhou natives who are doing spirit writing are opening up their temples to haka people joining them uh so this is part of you know the transition of taiwan from a what was originally you know obligatory te temple cults based on native place association to voluntary groups based on a commitment to a to a common goal often charity education and things like that uh so uh, again what i want to do is you know try to focus more on the 20th century and the ch and how these network being a historian uh how these sort of networks changed over time and the way i'll, I'll be able to figure that out is to get the names of the people who are participating at different times. And, you know, and I've already seen then some, some of these, some of these uh, Hakka elites who took part in the temple, they were marrying, some of their wives were Zhangzhou natives. So there's, so if you can, so if I can do more systematic study of this, then I can sort of try to put this together. It's all very sort of dr dry social historical work, but once you get together and you start putting faces on it, I, I really want to sort of make the social and cultural history of this place come to life and, and give it a human face. And that's the, overall goal of this work. Another question for Professor Katz, uh, to help uh, catch up with <laughs> asking him questions. Uh, you, you mentioned the uh, coincidence uh, uh, what might be just coincidence, but doesn't, but you seem to not think so, of the timing of uh, <clears throat> Ahaka and other sub-ethnic groups uh, uh, just building and maintaining temples together in Malaysia, I think it was, yeah. and in Taiwan. And oh, where, was there a trade or social network of some sort that you were, have started to trace between uh, uh, <clears throat> Taiwan and the, the uh, wider region? I'm just curious about that. And is, is it a goal of yours to, to uh, show that it wasn't just coincidence that these uh, dates are so close together. <laughs> I don't think there's a cause and effect in the fact that like a trend starts in in Taiwan and uh, transmits over to Malaysia. But it's interesting. It, it's what happens in Malaysia is uh, there's a period of feuding, and when the and and after the feuding is over, and there's also changes in in the colonial government and the rules that are used to govern temples. But there's there's this one temple that one of my students just published an article on in Minsu Chi to a deity known as Shen Si Shi Ye. Shen is Sun Shen the Shen and Si, Yi er San the Si, and then Shi Ye, uh, who starts out being worshipped by Huizhou natives, not the Huizhou of Anhui, but the Huizhou of Hakka uh, native places. And then over time, by, by 1907, when there's uh when the temple is reconstructed you get other ethnic groups uh joining and then part of part of that is because in 
this area, the overseas Chinese are a minority themselves and are surrounded by Malays. And so they're trying to band together for their, so a lot of it is, is sort of self-interest and protect and self-protection. Uh, so I think it's a different factor than what was happening in Taiwan, which is uh, the development of new economic systems, joining the world economy, and uh, also the, the growth of these voluntary re religious associations to deities that did not represent uh, a, a particular native place. And so I think this is the sort of area which I'm going to try to try to pursue. But it's interesting that it all happened at the same time. But, you know, wh whether the factors are the same is, is another is another matter. Thanks for all the presenter. I think the everyone's talking is like really inspiring. Even though I'm not from I'm not from like a anthropology or history background, but I do have one question for Professor Katz. Is that um, you have mentioned that there was uh, one uh, trend was was discussing religious ecology. Um, I'm wondering, it's sort of like clarification probably I missed during your speech, is that, is that was, will also be part of your study that you are going to incorporate in college system uh, in study like a Hakka temple? Because while I was reading your abstract, you, I think there's like multiple times I think the environment for a Hakka temple has been mentioned throughout your words, like you talk about incense power and talk about tea industry. So I'm wondering whether if, if that is also your approach, would you mind like elaborate on that? Okay. Thank you. So I simply mentioned the term religious ecology or Zhongjiao Shengtai, which is a term that's been used by Chinese scholars when they could still use that sort of term. Uh, and it was uh, generally during the reign of Hu Jintao, and they were trying to figure out the role that religion could play in Hexia Sohui, in a harmonious society. Uh, so I was, but that's that is that's not. I'm just mentioning as a concept that's been used by other scholars. Philip Clark has written about that in in English as well. Uh, but that's not what my focus is going to be. My focus is on political ecology, and which is, political ecology is a framework. So trying to understand religious change in the larger context of you know, political networks, economic networks, and the environment and sort of larger environmental change. It's almost like an annals school approach to that. Uh, so that's the, you know, real goal. And then social network analysis to sort of trace the actions of the individuals who are involved. Uh, and to note that their networks that they, in, 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 apart from temple networks, they were also involved in political networks, camper trading, marriage, and things like that. So religious ecology was something was just a term that I used in the state of the field section of the paper to talk about uh, other concepts that seem similar to this one, but are not the ones that I'm going to be using. I'm going to ask a question. Uh, actually, I actually have a couple of questions for, for Jakob. Um, well, one's more of a comment that maybe you'll have a comment about, and then an actual question. Um, so thinking in terms of the, the theme of the conference, right, Taiwan in the making, uh, these are annual pilgrimages. So it seems as though it's really remaking Taiwan every year. And so I don't, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that need to remake uh, or if, there, if, that, if it is in fact fulfilling, if these pilgrimages are in fact fulfilling a remaking function. Um, the question uh, is that has to do with a, maybe a comparison between this, the, the Jinxiang and the, the Raojing, um, which serves a very different function the Raojing does, uh, right? It's, it's sort of, or at least if, if the, the Jinxiang is making Taiwan, uh, the Raojing is more sort of claiming the territory for the deity, right? It's part of the deity cult, at least in its original forms. And I, I don't know if you have thought about that comparison or if you have any thoughts about that. So I guess they're both comments rather than questions, um, if you have any comments. Yeah, thank you for those comments. Um, remaking Taiwan every year. Uh, what I'm thinking here is that I think the, the process of making Taiwan, what I'm referring to, is especially salient if you are participating for the first time in a in a pilgrimage, so that I'm not sure if it's if it really is as important for people who go every year, because for them, in, I think you tend to focus on other um, on other things during the pilgrimage. So be, you become a lot more invested in actually the reasons for why you're going on a pilgrimage, um, the what we would call perhaps the religious reasons, 
rather than this kind of experiential, purely experiential um, thing. But of course, it's always a combination. So whether it, I call it making or remaking will all be an abstraction that I'm that I'm using. But I think especially for people who are still seeking to get to know Taiwan, um, engage at least when they do this for the first few times, perhaps also only the first time. Um, this seems to be a very impressive, uh, an, an experience that impresses itself on um, young people that I've talked to. And with um, technically the Yozhuang is a kind of, it's not, it's not called Raojing, but it, it, it has this territorial aspect to it. Um, and yeah, so the religious reason or the religious um, logic behind it is one thing. But what I found was that, you know, there's so many people actually participating from outside um, by Shatun proper or by Shatun itself that for those people, the reasons for coming um, seem to be related to, to the experiential reasons for going on a pilgrimage itself. Perhaps, I mean, if, they, if those people really understand themselves as being kind of, as, as seeing Bai Shatun as a second home, I could, you could argue that it's kind of making the boundaries of this home, but I think um, it's more likely that it's kind of um, in a similar framework as experience and that this is something that is perhaps not um, a purely religious uh, reason for them, even though I find it difficult to really um, thread those apart from each other. But I wouldn't really want to oppose them. It's important to point out the differences in religious meanings, nevertheless. Thank you for that. Um, we have time for one or two more questions, if there are any. Uh, OK, great, please. Hi, uh, I'm Elaine from Indiana University, and uh, this is just more more about a, more a, more of a comment uh, because I feel like a lot of the papers here all uh, touch on the topic of materiality or material things, the fragility of silence, and talking about how social network forms in Taoyuan or Dashi area. So I'm, immediately I'm thinking about like Kula Ring. So I'm just wondering if that's a if if that's a appropriate analogy to think about how community form in that area? Kula? Oh, Kula, Kula. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. My, my apology, I apologize. But my question is for, for you, uh, Professor Kasi, is just uh, like what, what roles do uh, material objects play in helping them to form the social networks? And I have a similar question for Jacob is, um, so physical experiences, like the painful experience of walking, seems to be a crucial part of uh, what defining a pilgrim is. So I was just wondering, uh, is, it, is there a way to connect this physical experience of pilgrimage to the idea of uh, constructing an com imagined community through pilgrimage, or, or maybe just that's just too far-fetched? Thank you. I'm actually part of a project that Adam Chow has organized, putting together a book of material objects in Chinese religion. I got to write, I got to write about the Wang Chuan, uh, the plague boat. But for for this Guanyin Temple, the main material object is the pilgrimage flag or the Xiangqi, uh, and so all either individuals or temples all have their various Xiangqi, which they which they preserve. So I mean, and, and one way you can trace these networks is by going to people's homes and temples and looking at the pilgrimage flags that they that they have. Uh, so in terms of the material culture, that's the one item which comes up uh, most often so far that I will be looking at. There may be other ones as well, but that would be the, uh, the, the main focus at this point. Yeah. Yeah, Jakob, do you wanna answer the, the second question? Yeah, sure. Um, so I've always been uncomfortable with the concept of imagined communities as in, uh, it's just difficult to know how people or difficult to know whether people actually imagine the same things or if they, you know, how we, do we just know what, what they imagine. With physical experience, I'm more comfortable talking about experiences and when people are talking about, ex talk about experiences. And I'm trying, perhaps I'm seeing this as a bit of a, um, what I'm called, what I called a conduit on the way to 
thinking of belonging to an, an abstract place that ultimately is an Im imagined community, even though here the physical community is more that of people one encounters during a pilgrimage. So that would be a shared um, experience of, of having walked for a while with somebody and having talked and exchanged contacts or having experienced kindness, for example. Um, those are what people draw on when they want to give a picture to this, what this kind of com imagined community or the, the community they refer to is. Perhaps that's a connection I would make, but I'm still a bit uneasy about that concept. Thank you. I, I don't. Did you want to say anything about the material culture of the noisemakers? Okay. Um, uh, we do have time, but we can also uh, break, um, as I think uh, maybe that's the a good thing to do right now. So let me once again thank uh, our three presenters um, and all of the audience members for their great questions and the organizers one last time. Thank you all. Thank you very much.